our 2018 full schedule hasn't been posted yet, but be on the lookout for that in February. We always like to mention the Build Your AutoCAD IQ webinar pay playlist. There's a link to it in this slide deck, which you'll get a link to in your reminder email, along with the link down below, which is the Build Your IQ data set. So if you want to follow along with those webinars, feel free. And then we have on the right some links to helpful resources. We've got the uh, Autodesk community forms, which are staffed in the AutoCAD forms. So if you have a quick question, one of our expert elites or one of our uh, associates will be happy to help you out. We also have the customer council. So 2019 is in production. You might be able to join the beta program for that by joining the customer council. Always good to provide feedback. And then where this is a build your webinar or build your AutoCAD IQ webinar, we always like to include these getting started links. Um, so you've got learn and explore, downloads where you can get updates and hot fixes for your product, some general troubleshooting to get you started, system requirements, and we have those both for AutoCAD and AutoCAD LT. So those would be some helpful links also included in the slide deck. Before we go over the agenda, I've got a couple poll questions we always like to ask. And the first one is, is this your first Autodesk help webinar? It looks like for a lot of you, no. We've got a lot of returning viewers, but we've got a few new people, which is awesome. If you're getting started on AutoCAD for Mac, this will definitely help you out. So we've got 12% new people. Again, thank you for coming. And 88% returning. Thank you for joining us again. All right, so our next poll is what AutoCAD application do you use? Um, so this will be most helpful if you're getting started with the Mac or are already using the Mac and uh, want to know what's new in 2018. But of course, our Windows users might learn something as well. And with your subscription, you do get access to both Windows and Mac. So if you want to test it out and you're already on Windows, you'll still have access to that. All right. So let's share that. Okay, so it looks like we've got 63% AutoCAD for Windows and 40% AutoCAD LT for Windows. So for those of you on Windows, this will be great to get you started with Mac. And then we have very few people, 3% on LT for Mac. And this will be great to get you started as well with those new features. Okay, so our agenda today, we're going over new features in AutoCAD for Mac, the Migration Assistant, Interface Changes, there's some updates to plotting, and then the other miscellaneous utilities. Okay, so let's hand this over to Jim so he can tell us a little bit more about himself and show us what's new. Hello, everybody hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, I guess I'll um, take over presenter here. All right, so uh, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, obviously, today we're going to run through AutoCAD for Mac. Um, I'll run through this kind of quickly as far as the About Me part. Um, I've been using AutoCAD since version 13, so I did start on the Windows version. Um, I've worked in pretty much every field that has to do with getting black lines on white paper. Um, I enjoy drafting and everything, so it doesn't really matter what discipline as long as I'm drafting something. Um, I'm an AutoCAD uh, certified expert and expert elite member. Uh, it essentially just means I spend way too much time out on the forums and in webinars and things like that. Um, I was honored to be uh, one of Autodesk's 35 under 35 designers to watch. Um, I own a a drafting service uh, called Impact Designs, where I do uh, consulting and so forth, architectural design. I also teach part-time at a local community college, their CAD programs, and I am an author on lynda.com, where I have some courses on AutoCAD for Mac and AutoCAD Mobile, um, and I am a former genius at the Apple retail stores, so as I said, I've drunk the Kool-Aid, and I have my, uh, my fitted pajamas, and quite the Apple fanboy and all that. So enough about me. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, AutoCAD for Mac itself. So uh, Autodesk actually left the Mac platform. They had a Mac version, but they left back in 1994, back when everybody else was sort of leaving uh, the Mac platform as well. Um, Intel processors didn't come to the Macs until around 2005, uh, so there's no actual way of running um, 
AutoCAD from 1994 through 2005 if you were using a Mac. Uh, Bootcamp was released in 2006, and this allowed users using Mac to actually install Windows on their Apple computers. Uh, and that was one of the first times in whatever it was about 12 years that users could actually use AutoCAD on a Mac product. Um, and that was pretty much it. You could either do dual booting or you could use a virtual machine, but that was really your only options if you wanted to run AutoCAD on an Apple computer. In 2010, Autodesk announced AutoCAD for Mac, which was the first Mac native AutoCAD release in 17 years. It was completely rewritten from the ground up, so it wasn't just a port or anything like that. They actually went through uh, every line of code and they rewrote everything so it would take advantage of the Mac operating system and Cocoa and so forth. Um, so. Let's look at where we've come since then. Uh, 2012, they added uh, AutoCAD for Mac LT. They made a bunch of improvements to XREFs, network licensing, the plot style table editor was introduced. Uh, we got a lot more layer tools. 2013, we got the project manager, which allowed us to use sheet sets. Uh, we could do PDF underlays and um, different path arrays. 2014, they added retina support, so they redid the entire interface, so it was uh, capable of doing 4K and 5K uh, icons and interface and so forth. They added eTransmit, or pack and go, um, and they also introduced Autodesk 360 support. In 2015, we finally got dynamic block editing, layer states, data linking, we got quick select. 2016, they added XREF path mapping. This was rather important. This allowed users who were using Macs and Windows uh, to actually work in the same office. If uh, on a Mac computer they don't use drive letters, they use volume names. So this allowed you to map the same external reference on a Mac and have it show up properly on the Windows side so you could work in a multi-environment office. Uh, they added Express tools as well, the DIM tool, uh, Rev Cloud improvements. Last year they completely revised the interface. Uh, this was one of the biggest hurdles I found in people moving from uh, Windows to Mac was just getting into the interface. It was a very uh, Mac-like interface, and a lot of people were just kind of thrown off by that to get started with. Um, we also got PDF importing, just like the Windows side did, uh, associative center marks, and some miscellaneous improvements. And how about 2018? Well, that's why we're here. One of the biggest additions and one I was quite happy with is the Migration Assistant. So. Going through all of those different versions, every time you reinstalled AutoCAD for Mac, you had to pretty much reset up AutoCAD for Mac from scratch. Uh, AutoCAD for Mac doesn't support profiles at this time or uh, the, uh, the ability to export CUIs or any of that information. So all your customizations would be lost every time you went through one of those versions. So in 2018, one of the first things you'll see when you load up is the Migrate Custom Settings dialog box. This allows you to pull in all of your settings from your previous install of AutoCAD for Mac. So this is very important. If you're going to install AutoCAD for Mac 2018, don't uninstall your previous version just yet, before, uh, at least until you get 2018 installed and you've got make sure that you have all of your customizations going. Uh, if you click on the View Details button there at the bottom, uh, you can choose exactly which of your custom settings that you want to bring in. So the CUI, again, it doesn't support user profiles, but they are kind of stored. So all of your uh, system preferences, all the preferences that you have, the color of the backgrounds, uh, what the right-click menu does, your support file paths, all that stuff is actually stored, and this lets you bring it over. Uh, your command aliases, your plot files, templates, uh, my properties, which is something that's unique to AutoCAD for Mac, um, any hatch patterns or line types or any of that custom information that you've all brought in. So after importing all of this, it actually comes up with a uh, little log file here, which I'm showing. This shows you all the files that were copied and where all those files are. So um, where they were in, you know, the library application support, all the way down to the, uh, the P list or the preferences list, uh, so that you can see exactly which files were brought over from the previous version. So once you get into AutoCAD for Mac, what does it actually look like now that you've got all your settings brought in? Well, it doesn't quite look like that. So this is uh, the um, this was that last release that I talked about back in 1994. This was the last version of AutoCAD for Mac uh, that was supported on the Mac for 17 years. So fortunately, this went away, and we immediately got something that looked a little bit more like this. And if this is one of your first times seeing AutoCAD for Mac, you can tell uh, if you were coming from the Windows side and you come up to this, it looks a little bit jarring the first time you look at it. So I mentioned in 2017, they redid the interface. In 2018, they made a couple more tweaks. And this is the interface that we have now. 
So it should look a little bit more familiar than the previous interface. It's got some elements of the uh, that make it uniquely Mac, but it's also brought over a lot of little nuances from the Windows side as well. So kind of show them uh, side by side. On the left, you see AutoCAD for Mac 2015, and that's pretty representative of what it looked like from 2010 all the way up through 2015 or 2016. Uh, the one on the right is the Windows interface, and that's Auto, uh, Autodesk AutoCAD 2017 uh, on the Windows side. And then in the middle is AutoCAD for Mac 2018. So you can see it's got some very similar nuances. It's picked up a lot uh, going back and forth between the two. Um, but it's still a little different. It still has its own uh, its own Mac kind of feel, but hopefully it shouldn't be too, too jarring for somebody coming over from the Windows side. Now, moving from AutoCAD for Mac 2017 to AutoCAD for Mac 2018, they did revise a lot of the icons. So they went in to try and give it a more updated, a little bit flatter look uh, that a lot of applications are using. So you can see on the left, 2017, and then 2018, the line icon, the uh, polyline icon, you can see how they've been tweaked just a little bit. They're still recognizable. You can still immediately look at it and know that, that yes, that's the rectangle tool. But now it's just a little bit flatter, a little bit cleaner, a little bit easier to identify. And you can see those changes all the way down throughout the rest of the tool sets. Another thing that was changed or added, uh, they uh, obviously this is the right side of the screen. So this is looking at the layers palette. So one of the changes that they made in 2017 was they made the layers and the properties palette uh, sort of this one singular palette that was over on the right side of the screen and it was locked in. You couldn't really do too much with it. You can show it or not show it, but you couldn't move it around. You couldn't undock it. It was just sort of locked into that side of the screen. And I know a lot of uh, users who use multiple displays wanted to be able to pull that off and put it on their secondary display or move it around the screen and put it somewhere else that made more sense for their particular workflow. So uh, 2018, we've added that feature. So now if you look in the upper right hand corner, and I'll demonstrate this in just a moment, but now we can actually pull these palettes out so you can move them around the screen, put them wherever it is on the screen that you'd like to have them um, while still having the ability to dock them over there to the right side of the screen. And obviously, just looking visually uh, on the left and the right there, you can see the differences in the icons. Again, very recognizable which one the make current layer is and the match proper, match layer and things like that. It's just a slightly cleaner interface. The icons look a little bit flatter, a little bit nicer. Um, so overall, just a little bit of an improvement. So let's actually take a look and see what this looks like in AutoCAD. So again, here we have the interface. I have just a basic uh, drawing open here. Um, we have, again, all the new icons that we see over here on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, showing up over here, over on the right side, we have the, uh, the new layers palette and the properties palette. So again, I mentioned that uh, in the previous versions, these were kind of locked in. Well, now we've got a new icon up here in the upper right corner, right up here. And if we click on that, it actually allows us to pull out these panels so that we can move them around the screen and place them wherever it is that we like on the screen. When we're done uh, doing whatever work that we need to, all we have to do is click on the little icon here, and it pops it right back up into place. And there we are. And this is still, uh, we can still make this a little bit narrower or wider as we like, just by clicking and dragging on that. But if we need a little bit more screen real estate, and one of the first things I notice is, obviously the uh, we don't have the ribbon across the top of the interface like we do on the window side. We have what they call the tool set down here across the left side of the screen. And it's a little bit wider and it takes up some left to right room on the screen. I actually kind of like this given that a lot of monitors are obviously widescreen format. I'd rather give up a little bit of my left hand side of the screen than losing the uh, what little uh, vertical space that I have. But for users who think that this is a little bit too wide, we have a little collapse icon right here that kind of brings those down in. And this is this was introduced in 2017, but it you know picks us up just a little bit more screen real estate. But if you find that's not quite enough, maybe you're working on a 13 inch MacBook Pro or even an 11 inch MacBook Air, screen real estate is definitely at a premium. So over here on the right side for the properties and the new to, uh, palettes over here, we have a similar collapse button right up here in the upper right corner. So I'm gonna click on that. And now we can see that all of the palettes have now been collapsed. This is kind of like docking uh, or the auto hide function that's on the Windows version. So now I can simply put my cursor over one of these guys. It'll pop out when I need it to. And as I move my cursor off, it goes away. 
Uh, this works the same for the reference manager, the XREFs, and we also have the content center. So content center is kind of like the uh, tool palettes that are on the Windows version. Um, so we have access to all the blocks that are in the drawing, or we can go in and look at different blocks, um, uh, like the complementary, you know, architectural blocks and so forth. Uh, but this, again, works just like the, uh, the tool palettes. All we have to do is grab the block that we want and just drag it into AutoCAD, and there it is. So again, makes it a lot easier, save yourself a little bit of screen real estate just by collapsing those. You can, again, bring them right back out to where they were. Another thing that saves you a little bit of screen real estate, if you noticed when I collapsed this, there were actually three different uh, palettes there. There was the uh, Layers and Properties palette, there was the External References palette, and there was also the Content Center. Well, those show up as tabs now across the top of the screen. I actually really like this. This takes up uh, minimal screen real estate. It's kind of like you know a little mini ribbon. I've got my tabs over here but they're all taking up just the same amount of screen space. So again, I've got content, I've got my reference manager, and then I have my layers and my properties. And you can expand this little uh, in the layers area up here. If you want to see your whole layer list, we've got a little expand button right there. You can uh, click on that. You can drag it down and see all of your layers as you like. So a couple of handy new little interface features, nothing overly dramatic, but some very, very helpful stuff. Again, uh, saving screen real estate is something I'm definitely all for. Another uh, new feature that we got is a new command alias editor. So in the past, if you wanted to edit the command aliases on the Mac side, you had to go into the PGP file, you had to open it up in text editor, and actually go in and make your edits. And that can be a little bit daunting for some users if they're not quite familiar with, uh, you know, exactly what the... Um, the formatting of the commands are. But if we go up to Tools and under Customize, we now have a brand new command alias editor. So this is uh, very similar to the Windows version. We have all the list of all the commands that we have here, and we can uh, find our custom ones, or uh, we can obviously uh, kind of filter that list just a little bit. But this is all the command aliases. Now, if you're not familiar, command aliases are essentially the shortcut keys that you type in in order to invoke a command. So uh, things like you know C for circle, or maybe uh, let's look up and see what a mirror is. So for the mirror command, we've got flip. You can actually type in flip, you can type in mi, or you can type in reflect, I guess, depending on what your, uh, what your verbiage is for the mirror command. Now, personally, uh, as a user, as I've found going through the years, there's a little tip that I picked up, and this was from one of the first CAD managers that I ever worked for. And the first thing that he did when he set up his new computer was he would go in and edit the command aliases so that they made more sense to what his workflow was. So uh, in his particular case, a command like, let's say, circle. So circle right now is the command alias C. The copy command is CO. Well, I don't know about you, but I can type in the same key on my keyboard faster than I can type in two separate keys. So the first thing that he would go in and do was he would turn, he would go find the circle command, take the command alias right here. I'll just uh, go ahead and click in that space and I'll let me edit it. And I'm going to turn circle from C to CC. Press return to accept that. And then I'm going to go back and find that copy command. So there's my copy command. So instead of typing in CO, I'm going to, again, click up there, get rid of that extra O, and now I just have C. So if I click Apply, and then OK, so now if I type in just C, Enter on my keyboard, now I'm in the copy command, and I can copy my objects. If I type in CC, Enter, now I can draw a circle. So as a tip, I go through and I actually have about maybe a dozen or so of these that I use all the time. So I usually uh, change things like I change... Uh, obviously, C from uh, copy to uh, from circle to copy, and CC for uh, circle. I use D for distance as opposed to D text. Um, I use uh, EE for extend, so I change that to the extend command. Um, I also use uh, M for move, and then I use MM for mirror. Just makes it a little bit quicker to get into the mirror command. Um, I use R for rotate instead of uh, redraw. I use RR for regen instead of redraw. Uh, so a couple little things like that. Just think about the tools that are the commands that you're entering in all the time and see if there's an easier way of going in and editing those. So again, layer isolate, uh, properties match, all of these little tools that I use really, really often. I go in, I set my uh, specific command aliases, and it makes my workflow run just a little bit quicker. 
So another big change in this version of AutoCAD for Mac is the plot uh, dialog box. So if I go up to File and Print, we now get the plot dialog box that looks much, much closer to what we would find on the Windows version of um, uh, the plot dialog. In the past, we got something that looked a little bit more like this. It was a very simplified, very streamlined version of the print dialog. Uh, and that's because it was actually going into the Mac operating system dialog box, the one that was controlled by the Mac operating system. Now, instead of using that, uh, AutoCAD for Mac uses its own plot dialog box as the first one that you go into. So you can choose your printer, your paper size. You can even uh, go directly into a page setup if you have one loaded. And you can make all of your changes here without having to go into another dialog box just to get to all this information. I find this incredibly useful, and I didn't realize quite how much I missed it until I actually had it here. Uh, in front of me and I realized how much I really use this. So the page setup obviously for me is a very big one, uh, but being able to change all these settings now is a lot easier. Another kind of a common tech question that we would get on the uh, AutoCAD for Mac side is originally we didn't have the virtual system printers. So we didn't have the virtual printers that AutoCAD on the Windows side would include things like uh, DWG to PDF or in the newer versions, um, the uh, uh, AutoCAD PDF uh, general documentation or the high quality or any of those virtual printers. And what that meant was if you didn't have a physical printer installed in your on your Mac, it was really, really difficult to print. You didn't have a printer, so you couldn't choose a paper size uh, or even output just to a PDF. So now AutoCAD for Mac now supports having no printer installed whatsoever. So you don't need a physical printer uh, installed. All you need is AutoCAD for Mac. So we have the same uh, kind of virtual presets that we have here on the Windows side. So high quality, general documentation, web and mobile, and smallest file. So I can click on uh, high quality print there. I can choose my paper size. So I now have all the same paper sizes that I do from the Windows side. Uh, and again, if you're working in a mixed-use environment, so if you're working in a mixed environment with Windows and Mac, this makes life a lot easier because you don't have special custom paper sizes that you're using on the Mac side that didn't necessarily show up on the Windows side. So every time you would open up a file to print on the Windows side, it would come up and say, hey, I don't have that paper because I don't have XYZ printer. Now you can set you know, AutoCAD general documentation, choose your paper size, and know that it'll be there on the Windows and the Mac side, and it'll all be nice and consistent. We still have the option we can uh, click on here to print. So if I click on that, there's my uh, my PDF print that comes up. Or I can close that and we'll uh, go ahead and cancel out of that. Now those virtual uh, PDF printers are still available also in the publish command. So we do have the same or very similar publish uh, option that we have on the Windows side. So I can uh, take my files, I'll get rid of my uh, model space, and I just want to print the... Um, uh, my regular pages here, I still have the same, again, same presets, AutoCAD PDF, general documentation that I can use in order to create my PDFs. So it's a really easy way of creating, of just plotting your entire drawing in one shot without having to print each individual uh, page. Now back in that plot dialog box, if there are some settings that you want to change, uh, let's say I'm in general documentation, but I don't really know what the difference is between high quality, general documentation, web and mobile. I mean, I just don't understand what the differences are. We have the little option right here, PDF options. Here we can go and we can set the vector quality. So I can crank that all the way up to 4800 if I like. The raster image quality, I can crank that all the way up to 4800 if I like. Uh, if I want the lines to overwrite or merge with, you, with each other, I can, whether I want to include the layer information uh, in my PDF, all the layers that I've created, uh, if I want to keep true type fonts or create bookmarks or all any of that information, I can include or not include in the PDFs that I'm creating. So that's a handy little guy right there in the PDF, uh, in the plot dialog box. Uh, another uh, handy little button that we have down here is now apply to layout. So this is another little feature that I didn't realize quite how much I missed it until I uh, kind of got it back. And the idea is if you are in a particular plot uh, dialog box, let's say I'm going to switch over to my cover page right here real quick. And if I go into plot, uh, right now I'm obviously using the uh, cover page setup. If I make some changes, uh, let's say I'm going to switch this to my high quality print here, and I'm going to go up and choose... Um, I'll use a uh, full bleed D, so 36 by 24, right about there. Uh, so once I've made all these changes, if I want to save these changes to this particular page setup, now I can just click on Apply to Layout. So now if I cancel and go back in to plot again, 
all of my changes are there and they're saved to the layout itself. So I've overwritten the page setup. So little things, but again, if you're doing this uh, more than you know a couple times a day, these little things tend to add up really quickly. Another improvement to AutoCAD for Mac 2018 is the uh, PDF import. So in 2017, we got PDF import just like the Windows version did. I don't know about you guys, but I was definitely quite happy to finally be able to just import my PDFs directly into AutoCAD um, and actually use the geometry. And like any other feature, it's improved over the past year, so it's a little bit faster. Uh, it recognizes more items, so it's a little bit cleaner as it does the import. Um, but a, one of the big complaints that people had the first time around was the ability to import SHX or shape fonts. Uh, AutoCAD didn't really handle it terribly well when you imported the PDFs that had those type of fonts. Uh, we kind of break them down and instead of text, you just got a series of lines that sort of looked like the text, and that was about it. So in 2018, we got some improvements to that. So this is a PDF that I created um, that I've attached, that, um, and it is a separate PDF. We can see that over here, PDF underlay. Uh, and the uh, font here is an SHX font, so it's a shape font. So what I'm going to do now is if I were to import this PDF, I'm going to go ahead and click on the visor up here to import my PDF, and I'll choose exactly what it is I want to import. And I'm just going to detach the PDF after that so we can see it flashes for a moment and imported all my information. But instead of text, I've just got a bunch of lines, and that's about it. They're all just a series of polylines, so it's not overly useful to me uh, in its current shape. So now, if we go over to the text uh, panel on the tool sets, we have two new buttons over here. One is Recognition Settings, and one is Recognize SHX Text. So if I click on this, we can change the settings that we want this to go looking for. So if I add in like Roman S, uh, let's see, Roman C, maybe complex, um, convert to text when it matches, I can set that. I can change the layer that it brings in, uh, the uh, uh, imported uh, shapes and so forth in. Uh, I can have it use the best matching or the first matching. I'm going to go ahead and ch change this to the best matching font. I don't want to go with just what's uh, easiest. I want to go with the best. So once I've got my settings here, I'll click OK. And now I can select my objects. So I'm going to grab all my objects here, press return. It'll uh, think about it for just a moment. It's actually going through looking at the shapes and comparing them to shapes in the font. And it's going to tell me, all right, well, it looks like just under 2% of the geometry was not converted to text, but I was got nine new text objects, and it uh, matched it up to the simplex font. So if I do close, now I can select my text, and we can see oh, it's M text. If I double-click on it, I can go in and actually edit the text as I see fit. It's actual text now that I can use. Uh, it works really, really well, but there are some little things. It doesn't handle punctuation terribly well. So if you notice, I've got a little, uh, that's that less than 2% there that it didn't import didn't quite uh, understand what the little periods were. Um, so everything else, though, it imported. So I've got now nine pieces of usable text. So handy little tool if you're importing a lot of PDF files and they have a lot of shape uh, fonts, you're getting a lot of PDFs from uh, architects or older files. Uh, you can still go in and convert all of your text, uh, all of your fonts to actual uh, text that you can go in and edit. So handy little feature there. Another text improvement uh, with AutoCAD for Mac 2018 was the uh, text to M text feature. Now this was an express tool that was added a few uh, versions ago, but they've gone through and improved that quite a bit uh, in order to, um, to make life a little bit easier for us. So uh, there is the uh, icon, I believe it's right over here. Uh, um, let's see, convert, uh, there we are, convert text to M text. And the command is just text, the number two, M text. Uh, if I click on that, now before I select my objects, if I look down in the command line, I have the uh, settings here. So if I just type in SE and press return, we now have a new little dialog box here that helps us uh, kind of customize exactly how this text is going to be combined. So I can say, yes, obviously I want to combine it into a single M text object. I can either do top down order or I can now do a selection set order. So if I click on OK, I can now select, let's grab the first one. We'll grab the bottom one here and then we'll grab the middle one and press return. We can see it kind of flipped it up there. And now if I double click on it, I have, we can see that yes, I do have just a piece of M text. And I can go in and edit. So 
very simple, very straightforward, but again, if it's something that you're doing quite a bit of and you maybe want to, you know, your text is out of order in some way or uh, different things like that, we have some, uh, some new options and some new uh, improvements there. Another improvement that we got this year in AutoCAD for Mac 2018 is the uh, the flatten tool has been uh, has been introduced and kind of reintroduced a little bit and uh, tweaked just a bit. So uh, here we have I have a 3D model that I imported directly from the manufacturer's website. Uh, it's a wireframe, uh, but it's a, a polyface mesh uh, in this particular one. But obviously it's a little bit complicated for just a simple floor plan or elevation that I'm trying to draw. But I do need to get the geometry out of this so that I can actually kind of tweak it. So I'm going to uh, set this up so that I'm looking at it from the front. There we are. And I'm just going to type in the word flatten. I'll select my objects, just grab everything right there, press return. It asks me if I want to remove all the hidden lines. I'm going to go ahead and say yes. It takes it a moment. And now I just have all of my basic geometry. So I could do a boundary uh, shape around this in order to get the outside, uh, to get a single closed polyline that I could use. Um, to make my life just a little bit easier. And if I kind of orbit this around, we can see that, yes, it did actually flatten the entire object. So very easy way of taking your 3D stuff and getting 2D elevations or plans or so forth out of it. So go find the, uh, the 3D model and just use the flatten tool. So very handy addition. The next set of uh, sort of improvements that AutoCAD for Mac 2018 has made has to do with external references. Now, external references is obviously a big part of a lot of people's workflow. Now, I mentioned before about the changing uh, the external references from Windows to Mac. So if we look at, let's say, this uh, external reference, I have the, some title information here. If we looked at the saved path, the saved path for this is actually, uh, it actually includes the volume information. So instead of using, uh, there's no, you know, uh, C drive or D drive or P drive, it's just the volume called Macintosh HD and everything is saved past that. So if I was working in the Windows side and I was working in the Mac side and I kept going back and forth and back and forth, the program would get a little bit confused as to whether or not it was looking for the C drive, uh, C colon drive or my Macintosh HD. Uh, this gets to be kind of tedious if you're going back and forth and back and forth. So a few versions ago, we uh, released this. It's called server path mapping. And the idea is you can add an address on my uh, current server. So if I grab, let's say, my, uh, we'll grab my, my work drive there, uh, we can click that. And then we can actually change that to what it might be on the other system. So C colon, uh, and say impact, and say OK. So now I can actually save that. So anytime that AutoCAD Windows opens up, it'll see that uh, path and use that path. If it's on the Mac, it'll use the Mac path. So this allows me to go back and forth really easily without having to worry about uh, updating all my, uh, not finding all my external references. Another new feature that was added in 2018 is the ability to select a new path. So if you're uh, changing the uh, location of your file or what have you, you can actually select a new general path in order to map out all of your uh, external references. Also, the new default now is relative. As before, it used to be absolute. Now I can really easily, just by right-clicking on the, uh, the actual, you know, external reference here, I can change the path really easily to make it a relative path instead. Another interesting little feature here is if I were to try and save my drawing, my DWG file, in a new location. So again, it's looking for the, some of the title block information in a very specific location. But if I do a save as, and let's, uh, I'm going to put this out here in my documents folder and click on save. Um, and let's change that one more time. Let's go put it someplace that I don't have anything. Let's say downloads. So it immediately comes up with, to me now and actually says, hey, you're about to put your drawing in a new location. Do you want to update all the external references with relative paths? Right now they're set to uh, absolute or a different path. I can update all the paths really easily to relative paths. So if I click on that, it'll update the paths and now that's the first place it'll go looking for all my external references. So again, really handy little feature that don't quite have on the, uh, the window side just yet. Maybe they'll catch up eventually.
So um, one last uh, little uh, kind of improvement that we've uh, had over the past year is, has to do with uh, selection sets and so forth. Um, that has to be if you've um, actually, let's say I've selected a few objects and I move them off the screen and I select some more objects and I get into a function like, let's say, move, those original objects are now uh, actually part of the selection set. So moving them off the screen doesn't actually remove them from the selection set anymore. It still maintains them and keeps them exactly where they uh, where they need to be or as part of the set, even if they get moved off the screen somehow. Uh, this is really handy if I start a window. Let's say I start a window here and I start to move it all the way over to here. As I go back, we can see all those elements that were off the screen still got selected. And this was not the case in previous versions. So again, if I start my window on the one side of my screen and I work my way over, let's go all the way across to about here and I click to end my selection set, all of the stuff that should have been in the selection set that I was intending actually gets selected as opposed to what was off the screen previously wouldn't have actually been selected. And those are the bulk of the new features in AutoCAD for Mac 2018. So obviously, the real big one was we got the migration assistant. So if you have a version of, uh, if you've got a version of uh, AutoCAD for Mac installed previous to 2018, make sure you don't uninstall it before installing to 2018. That way you can bring over all those customizations that you've made, PGP files, CUI files, if you made any custom menus or added buttons or uh, um, icons to the uh, tool sets, all those will be brought over and everything will be updated. Uh, we got tabs for palettes now, so again, you can pull those palettes off the uh, off the right side of your screen, move them around the screen as you like, uh, in order to help things, uh, you know, set your workspace up exactly how you want it to be. Uh, we have the ability to auto hide the palettes now, so we can kind of uh, dock them or auto hide them over there to the uh, the right side of the screen, so they are out of the way, especially if you're using a smaller screen like a laptop or something. We got some new prettier icons, always uh, visually impressive. We got the new command alias editor. So if you haven't edited your uh, command aliases yet, hopefully this will make life a little bit easier and make it a uh, little bit more of an option for you to go in and actually update those command aliases to help your workflow just a little bit. We got the brand new plot dialog, which in my opinion is heads and shoulders above the uh, heads and tails above the um, the previous uh, plot dialog box. We can go in and actually make all those changes right on the fly without having to open up a second dialog box just to be able to change the page setup. Um, we also got the new virtual printers. So again, if you have a laptop, you don't necessarily have a physical printer that you might have even installed. Now you don't have to worry with that. You can have the you don't have to worry about creating custom page uh, page sizes or paper sizes to be able to print to PDFs. It's all built right in, and it uses the same uh, engines and so, or the same um, names and paper sizes as the Windows version. So again, if you're working in a mixed office, you don't have to worry about it coming up and saying, oh, I can't print, print to this uh, device because it doesn't exist. Now it can be consistent and found through uh, every version. We got our PDF import improvements. So again, it's a little bit faster, a little bit quicker, a little bit more accurate. And obviously the SHX, uh, the shape fonts improvement is huge if you're uh, importing a lot of stuff from older drawings or people who use custom SHX uh, fonts, you can now bring all that information in and use it uh, as actual text. And the XREF path improvements. So again, everything comes in as relative now, so a lot easier to work with. It's a lot easier to update the paths, and especially if you're moving a drawing or saving a drawing in a new location, now it'll automatically ask you if you want to update the, uh, the pathing to relative so it grabs the right external references. So some really great uh, and handy features. So. My contact information is up there. Feel free to uh, reach out if you have any questions. My website is up there. You can follow me on Twitter at Jim Lapeer. Um, I've also just uh, introduced, as of today, a brand new YouTube channel. Uh, I don't have the custom URL yet because it's still quite so new. Uh, but if you uh, do a YouTube search for Mac and CAD, and you do have to add the little apostrophe there, I found out. Uh, but if you search for Mac and CAD, it should be the very first one that comes up. And I've got uh, one or two videos up there right now with a lot more uh, coming very, very soon. Uh, CAD uh, tips and tricks, a lot of general drafting uh, videos and so forth. So hopefully you guys can go and check that out. And that about does it for all the new stuff that I've got.
Okay, so we don't currently have any questions, uh, but of course feel free to submit them uh, and we'll be happy to go over them. Uh, while questions are coming in, one thing I always run into when in technical support is a lot of people don't know about how to set their My Properties and also about adding their own um, little tool tabs, it's mm. called the tool set. Um, the tool so sets. maybe you want to go over those. Those would be really helpful because I'm oh. always running into people absolutely loving those features but not really knowing about them because they're such a, a max specific thing. Right. Definitely. Yeah. This, that's what are they up? Uh, Custom properties is one of my favorite kind of uh, little Mac only uh, things that we have. So um, uh, if you're not familiar, what she's referring to is uh, over here on the properties palette, we actually have these, this little icon, this little slider right here. One says all and one says my. And if you look at my, you can see that it's a much streamed down version of the properties. And the idea here is instead of viewing all of the properties for a particular object. Now, right now, this is just my current ones. If I select, let's say, this piece of dimension. So this dimension object obviously has a lot of properties. I even have some collapsed here. Um, so it's got just a just an entire laundry list of properties to deal with. Now, I don't know about you, but on a daily basis, I really don't go in and necessarily change the alternate units of mine or maybe the text position. I'm not really worried about uh, all of those individual little properties. There's maybe a handful that I actually go in and edit on a daily basis or even on a weekly basis. Uh, and the idea with this is you can actually go in and flip over to my and again, this is a sort of a shortened properties list. And when it says my, it really does mean your properties list. Uh, this little icon right here allows me to actually go in and edit or customize the properties list so I can show just the properties of the objects that I want to see. So in this case, I usually like to see the general stuff. Um, if I scroll down here, um, I like to see the annotation scaling, obviously. Uh, for the text, I want to see the measurement. I want to see if there's a text override. Uh, let's say I want to add in the, um, the text rotation here. All we have to do is check the icon that we want. Um, and you can do uh, sections as well. So like for the fit, if I check the entire fit section right there, obviously all of the properties that fall under that category are going to be selected. So once I've gone through and I've selected all the objects that I want, I'll go up and I'll click on this icon one more time. And now here I have my custom properties list. Now this is different for every object that you object type that you select. So right now obviously this one is a rotated dimension. So those are the properties specific to a rotated dimension. If I come over and let's grab, let's just grab this uh, uh, polyline here, we can see I have a much different list for my polyline. And if I click on the uh, uh, customized list here, we can see I don't have nearly as many um, options or nearly as many uh, subcategories uh, that I have for all of my properties. But again, I have a much more streamlined list. Now, it's very easy to go back to the all list. So if there is a feature that you need to change, don't think that you're you know, removing that or eliminating that. You still have very easy access to it just by clicking on all. But again, the my properties is a lot easier. So what I usually find myself doing is the very first time I fire up AutoCAD, uh, when I first set it up, I'll run through and I'll just draw a bunch of stuff. I'll do a circle, a dynamic block, um, some hatch objects and uh, dimensions and uh, and so forth. And then I'll just run through really quickly. I'll select them and then I'll set up my properties, the information that I want to see. Uh, I'll get all those selected and then it saves it. It's obviously saved uh, in AutoCAD. It's not specific to the DWG file, it's in the session. So um, they're always there every time I go back into them. So again, it's just the idea of streamlining the workflow, getting hiding a lot of the information that you don't need on a, you know, a daily basis or even a weekly basis. And it's something that unfortunately is not available on the Windows version just yet. So again, one another little tick that we get over the Windows guys. Um, as for the, uh, the tool sets, so again, the tool sets I personally find, and I'm obviously biased, but I really like these over the ribbon. They're easier to edit. E uh, I, again, like having them over on the left side of the screen versus losing what little vertical uh, screen real estate I actually have, I can keep these over on the left side of my screen and I still have sort of a squarish uh, four by three kind of a workspace. Now these palettes here are um, uh, the tool, and it's called the tool set. Each one tool set has a series of panels, just like the, uh, the ribbon panels. The nice thing about these though is we can minimize these or collapse these so we can streamline, again, streamline the workflow. Get rid of 
the information that you don't need to see at that particular time. If I'm working on, you know, dimensioning my stuff, I can uh, minimize the draw and the hatch and stuff, just focus on text and dimensioning. If I'm uh, worried about drawing, I can collapse these and get back to my draw. I'll put my hatch up, my, uh, my modify tools, and I'll just focus on creating my new work. Now these panels are each one customizable. There's a little gear right there in the upper right corner. If I click on that gear, I can actually control really easily what commands are in that particular panel. So I can just check or uncheck, and we can see it happens all in real time. So I can add whatever commands or remove whatever commands if I want to simplify the draw menu. Uh, maybe I, I tend to use L for line, so I don't really go looking for the uh, line icon anyway. I can streamline these very easily to my particular workflow. Uh, not only can I control what's on here, and, uh, and I can control whether or not I visibly see each one of the panels, I can change the order of the panels as well. So this little icon down in the lower left corner is the drag to reorder. So all I have to do is select on the panel that I want, and I can drag it and place it somewhere else in the, uh, in the listing here. And again, it happens in real time, so I can see exactly what I'm left with. Now, if you're not happy with all of the panels that are here and you want to create your own little panels, it's a very simple, simple, straightforward. We have a new little plus button right here, and I can create my own custom panel. Uh, so using this, I can run through. Um, we have six different layouts that we can choose from. So again, these kind of look like the, uh, the ribbon panels. So we have some big buttons and some smaller buttons. But I can click on here and choose exactly what I want this uh, layout to look like for my custom panel. Let's give it a name. We'll just call it custom. And then I have the entire listing of all of the uh, uh, commands that we have available. And I can do a little search here to kind of filter these. Um, I have a client that I've done some custom commands for here. Uh, let's just grab a couple. Um, I'm going to make a circle uh, panel here. So I'm going to add in circle. And we can see, again, this shows up in real time. Let's do uh, radius. I'll do a 2.1. Uh, maybe a 3.1 there. So I have a couple different circle options there. And then let's do some arcs as well. So arc, uh, maybe I'll add the arc tool there. And if I notice down here, I also have the option of doing a drop down. So just like we have drop down tools, I can add a drop down. Uh, I'm going to call this one, I'll call this one arcs. And I'm going to move the arc tool actually underneath of that one. And I'll add a couple more here, kind of create my own little uh, arc drop down. Add a couple of those, and when I'm all done, all I have to do is click out, and there is my little custom panel. If I click and hold, there are my, my little drop down there. I can choose whatever commands I want, and of course, because it's my custom panel, it's the most important panel that I have, so we're going to drag that and put it right up there at the top of the screen so it shows up. If I find I don't like it or it's not quite what I wanted, I can go back, click the gear, and I can continue to add it, edit it, add uh, custom commands as I see fit. And if I don't like it, I decide I want to start over from scratch, just hit the delete button. I can delete the individual, uh, remove the individual commands here, or I can click on the little trash can icon and get rid of the entire panel. And if you're ever confused or you ever think you messed it up uh, way too much, go up, preferences, and there's uh, an option for, actually I think it even buried it, Reset AutoCAD, it's right there. So if you're ever confused or you think you messed it up a little bit too much, Reset AutoCAD right there will, will let you kind of reset that uh, the, the panels and the interface and everything. So did that answer your question? Yes, that is awesome. I show people that in technical support cases all the time, and they're just baffled about being able to make those little tool sets and, and change everything. It's so much easier than scrolling through. Um, okay, so another question we have. Uh, someone would like us to go over how to pull up the command alias editor again? Sure. So um, essentially, uh, it's up here under Tools, and then come down to Customize, and it's uh, right here, edit command aliases. The PGP file is what it used to be called, the program parameters file. Um, so we pull that up, take it just a moment. You can also type in the command is alias edit, uh, if you want to type that in at the command line, if you're more comfortable with that. So once we're in that, uh, again, this is just an entire listing of all the aliases that AutoCAD has. You can um, add your own custom one. So if you have a custom command uh, or, um, or something, you can actually add in your own. Or if there's one that's not here, you can add it in. Um, I mentioned before the uh, I use the distance command. So if I go in here and let's see, 
distance. So there's the distance command. I use it quite often. But again, instead of typing in di, I just like to type in d. Now, this particular alias is already assigned to dimension style. So I can uh, enter to accept the input and remove the conflict. So I'm just going to hit enter. And then I need to go find that uh, the d alias there. So if I do d, so there's there it is for distance. And if I do, let's see, might have already changed it for me, actually. Yep, it looks like it did. I think it uh, just removed it. So if I wanted to add in, or if I have a duplicate, let's say. All the way at the top. Um, oh, was it all the way at the top? The way up, it's got, yeah, it's got no. Uh, oh, undefined. There we are. Yep. yep. So now I can click in there and define it. So I usually use that as, uh, I just use, let's say, DD, and that'll be fine. So again, click Apply. OK, so now D should be my distance command. Very good. So again, alias edit. And even if you misspell it, AutoCAD is smart enough to figure out exactly what you meant. OK, and then we have another question. Can you change the size of the icons in the draw menu? Let's see. So uh, I assume uh, means the icons over here. So the only two options that we have, we have the little collapse button that makes them a little bit smaller. So again, they don't take up quite as much real estate uh, or the expand, but those are the only two options that I'm aware of. Um, I don't think we have like a large icon uh, uh, like they do on the Windows version. Okay, uh, let's see, what else do we have? Hmm. Any other questions from anyone? I see there was one looking for clarification, whether or not alias edit is available in Windows as well, which it is. I think it was first in Windows and yes. not available in Mac for a little while, unfortunately. Yeah, the only way to uh, edit the aliases in older versions was you actually had to go in. Uh, if you were to go, the uh, menu item was actually still there. It still said edit command aliases, but instead of bringing up the nice clean little dialog box, it would actually open up a text file that had the command aliases. And you just had to type them in in a very kind of, it wasn't overly difficult, but a very specific uh, format that you had to use in order to get them to work properly. And then you had to reload AutoCAD in order to get them to take effect. So it wasn't nearly as clean or as user-friendly of a way of uh, editing those command aliases. Ha, one hey, Jim. thing we had on here for a while. Yeah. Yep. Just to add to that, um, in AutoCAD for Windows, there is a command call. If somebody still edits the AutoCAD, ACAD.pgp, there's a command called re-init, R-E-I-N-I-T, very old command, and that will reload your, uh, I don't know if it's in Mac or not, but at least in the it Windows is. side, that is. Okay. So re-init is the way to reload the file, uh, a PGP file. Um, yeah, if you use uh, re-init, and then uh, if the value, I think if you typed in 16, was the one that uh, edited just the PGP file. Yeah, and then uh, yep. somebody is, was asking, can you change the size of the icons in the draw menu? No. No, uh, the only uh, like I said, uh, the only option we really have is to minimize it to make them a little bit smaller over here to kind of collapse them uh, or to uh, make them at the standard size. There's no easy way of doing like a large icons uh, that they have over on the Windows side. Hope that answers your question, John. I think those are the questions I, I can see. Still, uh, yeah, I'm not seeing too much else. Uh, but we do still have five minutes, so if anyone has a question, feel free. Oh yeah, to yeah. Somebody asked about actually the hatch scaling, annotative hatch scaling. If you mm -hmm. don't mind, kind of show it to them, might as well, since we have time. Sure. Yeah. So I'm gonna create a little hatch object here. Um, so yeah, if. Uh, we can um, select it and make it annotative. Uh, and you've got the, uh, obviously, the pattern here. And you can set the annotation scale. So if I set uh, this one to, I think I have a viewport in like quarter inch equals a foot. Um, yeah, so if I uh, update my view here for quarter inch equals a foot, there we are. So that's what it should look like at quarter inch equals a foot. Uh, and if I go back out to, yeah, we can see here is this, that one's half inch equals a foot. Let's make a new one just for that. Let me 
there we are. So now that should show up properly, even if, um, so that's pretty much the easiest way uh, is, again, selecting it, go over to the properties, turning it on annotative, and adding the proper annotative scale. Um, and then you can change the scale to whatever looks appropriate for your, uh, your particular drawing. And then when you come back out, it should show up properly in the, uh, in the viewport, as long as you've got your annotation scale for that particular viewport set as well. Awesome. And then we have one other question that looks like I noticed the alias edit window has a menu tab, but we don't remember seeing that in the Windows version. What does that do? So the uh, edit alias uh, dialog box, it actually brings you to the CUI. So this is our stripped down version of the uh, customized user interface that's on the Windows side. Now on the Windows side, it's a very big dialog box and it's got a lot of different sections into it um, that have to do with the uh, the workspaces and everything like that. Ours is very, very simplified. So we have the aliases here, which is the new tab that was added. We have the menus. So the menus controls what we see across the top in the menu bar. And it's just as easy to edit as any of the other ones. Uh, you have all the, me the menu items here. So like we have the modify. Um, I can go find um, any of the uh, uh, any of the commands that I like, let's say 3D constrained orbit, I can actually just drag and drop that into the modify menu, um, click apply, and now if I go up to modify, there's 3D constrained orbit. So it just showed up right there really quickly. Um, the commands over here, this is where you would go to actually create your own custom commands. Uh, so you can add your own command, uh, write up the macro here that you like, choose your uh, your image or your, inter um, your icon, and then you can go through and add it to the menus or to the uh, tool sets as you like. So this is, again, just our sort of simple, much more streamlined, much simplified version of the uh, the CUI, the customized user interface that you find on the Windows side. Awesome. And then another question, it looks like this one pertains to drafting, but we do still have a couple minutes. Um, how do you place a box around the text? Ah. Uh. This is actually one of my favorite little tips that I picked up. I actually picked this up from um, uh, Jeannie Arhus, uh, and this works on the Windows side and the Mac side. Um, there's a couple different ways of doing it, but the way that I found that works the best, there's an express tool um, called uh, T-Circle on the Windows side, um, and what it does is it just runs around and put, lets you put either a box or a circle around all your text, but all it does is draw the item, that's it. So if I go in and edit the text, the box doesn't update where it should. So if I were to go in and edit this on using this method, let's say we'll make that the, uh, the living room there, we can see that this one actually updates. And that's because I use a special uh, leader style. So if I go, I'm gonna go to the leader style dialog box here, and I have a special one here called room tag. And if we take a look at that, we can see that I actually have no, I set my leader type itself to none. Um, and then uh, I don't really care about the, the arrowhead or the leader break. For the leader structure, again, really doesn't matter too much. But the content, I use M text, and there's an option right here for frame text. So if I set that, turn that on, I can set my text height. Um, everything else is kind of subjective. Um, but again, the most important part is turning off the leader and then adding the, uh, the frame text item here. So now what will happen is if I want to create a new one, I'll, and it is set as my, make sure I'll set this as my current, uh, my current multi-leader style there. And then all I have to do is place my text. And the uh, opposite corner really doesn't matter. It's only going to be as big as it needs to be. But now I can type it out, click save, and it will uh, update itself every time that I um, add, or every time that I edit the text, it'll dynamically update itself. So again, I can't take credit for that tip. That was uh, Jeannie Arhus. She uh, showed that at one of the Autodesk University tips and tricks classes. But it is by far the easiest way that I've found to enclose text in an object. That is cool. I did not know that too. And uh, I, I think uh, people should visit the au.autodesk.com if they want to pick up more info too. Definitely. All right, so it looks like we're at the top of the hour now. So I've just got one last poll to run before we head out. So did you learn something new in today's session? Hopefully you did. I know I did. Uh, it looks like, oh no, a couple people haven't. That's okay. Oh no. 
They must have been playing with AutoCAD 2018 for Mac last month when it came out. All right, so let's share that. So it looks like 97% of you did, which is awesome. I know I did. And 3% are already experts on this, didn't learn anything. But we're still happy you joined us. And hopefully it was helpful, at least. All right. Okay, so thank you again for joining us. I think this was a successful session. Of course, there will be links to all of these data sets and the webinar recording in that follow-up email you'll receive fairly soon. So if you do need to review it, um, want to double check all of this information, you can, of course, follow along uh, and hopefully you'll learn something. Thank you.